Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this year's Nobel Lectures in Medicine and Physiology. Uh, the Karolinska Institute's Nobel Assembly has awarded the prize in medicine for discoveries concerning prostaglandins and related biologically active substances to three scientists, Professor Sune Bergström and Bengt Samuelsson from the Karolinska Institute and John Wayne from Wellcome Research Foundation. Thank you for your kind words. The prostaglandins are now part of every elementary textbook, so I am planning to tell you a little about how the background was in the early days and, and also recent development of the clinical field. Can I have the first slide, please? For once, we really know when my involvement started. And here you'll see the protocol from the Physiological Society meeting on the 19th of October, 1945. Hugo Terrell was chairman and talked about oxidations. And I gave a presentation of my studies on the oxidation of fatty acids, auto-oxidation, and oxidation with lipoxidase. And Van Euler countersigned it. And after this meeting, Van Euler approached me and asked me if I wanted to start looking at his extract that he had in his icebox since before the war. <laughs> I agreed. And um, he told me the following story. Next slide, please. The first uh, observation that there was some biological active compounds in human semen was done at Columbia University in the Department of Obstetrics Gynecology, where they found that when they were doing artificial insemination in women, sometimes they got violent contraction in the uterus, sometimes relaxation, and they related that to the content of the sperm. Now, the interesting thing is that a few years before that, I had worked for a year in, in Colombia. I had met Kerstrock. I had worked in the same lab as Sarah Ratner for a year, but never heard anything about prostaglandins. Next plan. This was followed up by a British uh, uh, pharmacologist, but he never moved very far except for showing that there was a blood pressure depression from this material and smooth muscle stimulation. At the same time, Van Euler made a very thorough study of the occurrence, next slide, of one of his many discoveries, compound P, in various organs. But he found that in semen and in extract of prostate glands, there was a strong blood pressure decreasing factor. And in the next slide, it also stimulated smooth muscles. And that's the method that we used in the purification. Now, let me digress for a second. And uh, next slide, please. And I want to show Eric Jorpus, who um, was my first teacher and really uh, has had the greatest importance for my work. We started, I joined in his heparin work, and I learned how you transfer laboratory findings into the clinic. He is more responsible than anybody for getting heparin accepted in surgery and so on. He was, uh, at that time, the chemistry department of the Karolinska was one of the leading laboratories in the world in nucleic acids and in peptide hormones, secretin, late the cholecystokinin. And Jorpus always told me that it's too bad that nobody works with lipids in Sweden. <laughs> 
and he uh, financed a trip to England in '38 when I spent a few months there working on bile acids. So from there on, I have stayed with the lipids. I then were happy enough to get a fellowship uh, to go to England for a year, working with Marion, but the war stopped it. I applied for a Swedish American fellowship, and because all the highly qualified docents didn't want to leave Sweden during the war, I was lucky enough to get out for a year and a half to Colombia. So I said, you're working on cholesterol autoxidation. And coming home, next slide, please. I continued working on autoxidation and discovered that when you oxidize linoleic acid, linoleate, oxygen is absorbed and the double bond are conjugated. In those days, it took most of one day to determine the conjugation, get the spectrum from the spectrograph, and to identify this, we synthesized the whole series of the various steric acids with hydroxyls all along the various positions. We collaborated with the Stenhagens. Next, please. We made the whole series and made uh, various physical measurements and learned how they behave in the mass spectrometer. Next, please. And this is what I reported when Van Euler came along and uh, asked me to start here. It turned out that lipoxidase, or lipoxygenase, it's called now, does the same conjugation of the double bond as the ordinary autoxidation. I was then with TRL, and he became interested and eventually crystallized this enzyme, as you know. Next, please. Now, I was fortunate to have brought home this device that Craig had developed at the Rockefeller Institute during the war for purification of uh, small amounts of active compounds. You turn this around, you can make a systematic uh, phase transfer. And with this machine and some other devices, next please, we could purify that crude extract about 500 times. And these are the tubes in this machine. And, and probably we had something that more than 50% consisted of a mixture of prostaglandins. At that point, I got 5,000 crowns from the Anderson Foundation to buy glands from Iceland, where they had isolated it. And the Icelanders required to get it beforehand. And we sent away the $5,000 and got 50 kilograms of completely rotten glands back. <laughs> so for this reason and for my moving to Lund, we more or less uh, left the field for a little while. Next, please waiting for better freezing conditions. But we made a report in Swedish to the uh, uh, doctor society here in Sweden. But uh, coming down to Lund, as Professor Reichert said, we had an empty institution, but we were extremely fortunate because at that time, Tage Erlander had started the big build-up of Swedish science. The Swedish Medical Research Council had started, and uh, what was called the uh, Medicinska Högskolarnas Organisationskommitté had uh, added a lot of staff to these institutions. So that, uh, next slide, please. So that, uh, here we have the uh, increasing amounts to the Swedish Research Council. And immediately when I came down, we got 350,000 crowns for equipment. And the building was rebuilt in the first year without any red tape. 
And an additional fortunate thing was that during this period, the National Institutes of Health in the US started their well-known international program, and we were fortunate to have quite sizable grants through this time. So that it was possible to, next please, have this group of able people training, uh, mainly on bile acids and lipid absorption. They all more or less directly or indirectly contributed to the prostaglandin development that then came on. Next, please. We took it up again, and um, we got glands from many countries, Norway, Iceland, the US also to some extent, and using the uh, methods we have used for bile acid isolation, we could get these two crystalline compounds out. Next week. And uh, again, fortunately, in Stenhagen's laboratory in Uppsala, Kirsten had developed the ultra-micro carbon hydrogen determination and on a fraction of a milligram, he determined the composition. And together with Rehage's mass spectrometer work, we could deduce what proved to be the correct formula directly. The E and the F only are changed by two hydrogens, this being a ketone and this reduced to an hydroxyl. Without these two units, it would have taken quite some time before we would have gotten that done. Next, please. And what really played a decisive role when we came back to Stockholm was the mass spectrometer development that Rehage had done. And he really had the first functioning combination instrument of a gas chromatograph and a mass spectrometer. Next, please. And this is the old big instrument he had built. Since then, you know, he has constructed uh, uh, more elegant small types that are spread around the world. Next, please. Well, this just illustrating how one with alkali could uh, modify the structure of prostaglandin E and then by degradation identify these pieces that were then puzzled together, next please, into these series of compounds. So this was prostaglandin E1, with one double bond, and this is F1 alpha. And with weak acid of bases, this series of transformations take place. And as you see here, the relative strength and blood pressure varies up and down along this line. So it explains why it was so difficult in the early days to get consistent results on the extracts. Next, please. Now we knew the structure, but not the stereochemistry. That was done by Professor Sixten Abramson in Göteborg. Here you have the five-membered rings and ester and so on. That took him about one year. It was the technology of those days. Today it would take three weeks. So the chemist wouldn't have any time to do anything. So this was finally the six prostaglandins. You see they are the difference is really the number of double bonds inside each group. But looking at this formula with 20 carbon atoms, you find that these cis double bonds were located as in certain of the essential fatty acids, which made us suspect, like many others suspected, that these might be precursors. I then uh, telephoned the most uh, competent fatty acid chemist who had made these acids in quantity and made them isotopically labeled. And he sounded not too happy when I phoned him 
He said, are you thinking about what I'm thinking about? Yes, I said. <laughs> oh, but he was uh, most generous. He sent us samples of arachidonic acid and the others. Next, please. And uh, it turned out that prostaglandins were formed. We'll come back to that. Before that, we just want to mention that the real surprise for us was that when you had isolated them, you could find them in any type of tissue. Some of them had been observed before. There was a factor in iris. There was something in menstrual fluid. They all turned out to be mixtures of various prostaglandins. Next, please. So Van Dorp and his group and our group here published together these uh, syntheses from the unsaturated fatty acids. And this, uh, next please. This synthesis is, was very important because you could transform from arachidonic acid to a mixture of this compound in 70% yield. So you finally could get material for the physiologists to work with. We had, uh, for getting this uh, material for our earlier work, had uh, uh, most important help from Dr. Weisblatt at the Upjohn Company. We had met already in 1940 when we were the two only graduate students in the world working on heparin. And uh, when these came along, we continued our cooperation. And um, as you will see later on, this cooperation has been crucial for the development. We had had contact with another outstanding American scientist, E.J. Corey, who in uh, 1954 had developed a method to stereospecific labeling of cholesterol. And we had collaborated and used that for the bile acid work. When we had, the structure was clear, he very considerately wrote and asked permission to synthesize it. And that's rather unusual. Uh, and six years later, that's the tube he sent me, the first milligram of synthetic E1. Similar things had been done at that, John. Next, please. Well, this just gives an idea how complex this uh, synthesis turned out to be. We were in a critical position around 1970 because we needed a lot of uh, prostaglandins for the clinical work. But these uh, elegant laboratory synthesis were not made into production until a few years later. But then happened one of the freaks of science. Next, please. Two Americans had been studying corals and other sea animals in the Mexican Gulf. And they found something that they suspected was biologically active. They contacted Upjohn and got it cleared up. And it turned out that this coral is the richest source of prostaglandins in the world. One and a half percent of the dry weight. And next please, that can easily be transferred into the common prostaglandins. And that was for several years what kept the clinical supplies going. But from 73 or so, the supply has been total synthesis. Next, please. Now, of course, pharmaceutical industry became interested, and uh, enormous synthetic programs of analogs started. And there must be much more than 5,000 analogs now prepared and being tested. You see the 
Inactivation of a prostaglandin takes place by oxidoreduction reduction at this point. So the first obvious thing was to place a methyl group there and block that. And here are different analogues that are in use in the clinic. There are two methyl groups to hinder this inactivation. There is a methylene, nine methylene we'll hear about later instead of a keto group. And various compounds have been prepared to get longer lasting or more specific compounds. Next, please. Now, when we had the crystals and, and we had some difficulty to convince our physiological and pharmacological colleagues to really look at it, but one of the crucial cooperation we did was with Don Steinberg and Marta Vaughan at National Institute of Health. They were working with the, the fat pad of rats. If you stimu stimulate that uh, fat pad, it, it uh, releases free fatty acids. You can do it with epinephrine or norepinephrine or glucagon or ACTH. But it was found that the E compound blocked this. And that was the opening showing how intimately connected the prostaglandins are with the regulation of the cell functions. In this case, they all these stimulation increase cyclic AMP and, and stimulate the release of fatty acids, whereas the prostaglandin E are decreasing the cyclic AMP. In other structures, they are, are increasing, but it varies. And I'm not going into that field, both the cyclic AMP and GMP are being influenced of, by different prostaglandins and in this way uh, influencing maybe every type of cell in their functions. Next, please. Now, when the physiologists got going looking at various animals, it turned out that there were very large differences between animals and between compounds. Sometimes they became more active with an additional double bond Sometimes the activity disappeared with one double bond, so one had to turn to humans in order to, you couldn't get too much information from animal work. And the first study in humans was done by my good colleagues. Uh, that was infusion of E in man, indicating the fall in blood pressure, increased heart rate, and uh, uh, Pernov and, and Kaiser and Lars R. Carlson has then done the most fundamental work on the human circulation with various analogues. Next, please. Lars Carlson made the um, use of this uh, effect and demonstrated here how what a uh, strong influence uh, hundreds of a milligram can have if you give it intra arterially into one arm. The blood flow increases tenfold but doesn't touch the other arm. And this he and Olson has developed into a therapy for peripheral vascular diseases that in some cases has a dramatic effect but of course not in all cases. Likewise, the prostaglandins are, next please, used in uh, cases of uh, ductus arteriosus <clears throat> in some congenital abnormalities. It is important to keep the duct open until the surgeon can correct the, uh, uh, and uh, therefore, the babies can keep with E1 or E2 therapy for a few days until they are stabilized and can be operated upon. On the other hand, 
you can use prostaglandin synthesis inhibitors to support the closing. And, and this is a use that has now been uh, registered by the Food and Drug Administration. Next, please. Now I will mention two very fundamental discoveries made by Dr. Robert at the Upjohn Company Physiology there. He found that in an animal, if you stimulate uh, gastric secretion with pentagastrin or something like that, injections of prostaglandins of the E-type inhibit. That is the common E2, 10 micrograms. And here you see half a microgram of these methyl analogues have a profound effect. The first study is here in Stockholm was done by Sven Andersson. He's no longer with us. Next, please. And he found how remarkable strong 80 microgram of this dimethyl block practically the gastric secretion for hours. This work has been continued by Katja Johansson. Next, please. And um, turned into a demonstrated the healing effect. The other discovery that Robert made was that it was well known that if you gave large doses of indomethacin or aspirin or if you gave boiling water or strong acid to anesthetize rats, you get bad erosions of the gastric mucosa. And the animals usually died in a few days. But if you gave 1616 dimethyl E2 orally 30 minutes before, and, and in fractions of a microgram, the mucosa was completely protected. How this cytoprotection acts is not quite clear, but it certainly is a reality, not only in the mucosa. You can also protect liver cells to some extent for uh, necrosis by carbon tetrachloride, for example. So this is a very active field at present. Next, please. Well, it was uh, logical to look into some <laughs> clinical aspects of indomethacin and aspirin at this point. Because, you know, normally there is maybe a fraction of one ml invisible blood uh, in the gut per day. But the usual dose of indomethacin increases this maybe to three or four or five mLs. But it was demonstrated here at the Karolinska for the first time that only a third of the milligram or 40 micrograms of prostaglandins completely protected the patient from this bleeding. You know, a few patients have serious bleeding with this drug, so it might, we'll see how much clinical use this observation will have. Next, please. The last aspect I will dwell on is in the obstetric and gynecology field. That's where the prostaglandins were discovered, and that's where they have found their greatest utility so far. <clears throat> Mark Bygdeman, who had started his thesis work with Van Euler and uh, studied the, the effect of various prostaglandins then on first in vitro and then in vivo, has here demonstrated how small amounts of E1 can cause uterine contraction in minute amounts. And this, of course, led to the suspicion that you might affect uh, a pregnancy interruption by this technology. Uh, the first uh, uh, therapeutic abortion was done in 
April or May 69. During the summer, Karim from Uganda was in stock and was told about it. He rushed home to Uganda and uh, did the same. And by chance, we happened to get into the Lancet in the same number. Next, please. Then started an intense activity all around the world exploring this with the normal uh, prostaglandins first, intravenously, you see you needed 100 milligrams, intramniotic, extramniotic, vaginal. But if you look at the methyl analogs, you see it's quite another order of activity. And you even with less than a milligram could interrupt the pregnancy by oral administration. Now this work was done mainly in the Western developed world, in the US, the UK, and Sweden. But at that time, SIDA had found that the uh, family planning devices that were used had to be improved. The success was not very good. They first wanted, considered starting an international foundation in Stockholm for research in this field, but after a few years was decided to have it in the World Health Organization. And uh, a program for research development and research training in human reproduction was initiated, of which from Swedish sources, about 60% of the funds were added. You see how it increased up to 15, 18 million dollars. And in this uh, program, there was a prostaglandin task force where I worked together with Professor Borrell and Bigdeman and with a group of outstanding obstetricians from around the world. And with this way of financing, you could uh, do the trials in countries where it's really needed, whereas, of course, pharmaceutical industry has to consider already the marketing and the future possibilities to sell the drug. <clears throat> Before I leave this slide, I would point out that of these grants, you see a sizable part went to industrial development and scientists in the US. And as Sweden was contributing 60% of these funds, Sweden repaid fully what NIH had given to Sweden 15 years earlier. Next, please. This illustrates the early days of the prostaglandin task force. These were the various methods that were developed in uh, our country. And then you see we had close to 3,000 patients with the normal and 3,000 on the 15 methyl. But the interesting thing is how this was distributed over the world. The greatest trials were in India. And uh, I vividly remember a late evening when Burrell, Bigdem, and myself were checking on this abortion work in India and found the following side that if you do this interruption of pregnancy during the first weeks, first three weeks after a missed menstrual period, it's a hundred percent success. There is no need for surgical intervention. If you do it later, a lot of the patients have to be treated in hospitals. So this really has the potential of being ideal in developing countries. And as you have seen in the newspapers, Big Demand has just finished a series of a hundred cases like this with success. They even have done it by self-administration. So potentially this is of very great importance. Next slide. 
After these 12 years, I think the prostaglandins' role in this field are quite clear. They are used for labor induction, that term, cervical ripening, the usual E2, with serious bleeding after delivery. 15 methyl injections have proved very good. For pregnancy interruption, you have the methyl and the new analogs. Uh, this is from sharing, this is from Japan. And you can use them at each stage. You can use them for cervical dilatation before suction, for death in utero, and so on. Next, please. Well, it's not only in human medicine. It is used in all animal husbandry now. And this is the most uh, interesting one. This is a herd of cows. Each point is one cow. And it signifies when they come into heat. He brunst. Usually, you know, the farmer has to look and, and catch the cow and it's in heat and have the artificial insemination. But if you inject all the cows on one single day, they all get into heat after about three days. And you can bring the veterinary and make artificial insemination of the whole group and get the calves at the right time of the year. And this means enormously in the countries with large uh, herds of cows. In this way, they can rapidly improve them genetically. They can have the offspring at the right time of the year. So the purely economically, this is probably the most important development so far. Next, please. Well. This has been a very short and sketchy discussion. This illustrates how the field has developed from the isolation and structure up to more than 5,000 uh, publications every year. But the question is, how did all these people get their prostaglandins? Well, as illustrated in the next slide, Upjohn sent out something like 75,000 samples during this period. And you see it's a very nice correlation. Most of the samples gave rise to a publication, at least in the same. But at this point, the coral was found in the Mexican Gulf. And then a lot of industries went down there and collected corals and, and got samples and they took over and then they analyzed it. So I think this illustrates in this field as in many others how important it is for the laboratory worker to cooperate with the pharmaceutical industry in developing drugs. And I think with the third partner being the World Health Organization, I think there are great hopes to increase the development for health and population control in the world. Thank you.